In this video I want to talk about the Hawthorne experiments. Uh, really what I want to do is to talk about the outcomes of the Hawthorne experiments or the Hawthorne studies, perhaps a better way of putting it. Um, I want to look at issues associated with motivation and uh, conditions of employment and what is it that engaged or disengages workforces from uh, participating in the various organizations within which they work. Now you'll see from the bottom right hand corner of the slide in front of you I've only got 13 slides in this talk so it's not meant to be an exhaustive study or a detailed study uh, of what happened at the, uh, the Hawthorne uh, works but what it is meant to do is to just show what were the outcomes, what was the what was the learning outcomes associated with this work and in that sense this is really a, a summary class um, a class which summarizes uh, the whole of the the whole issues associated with the the Hawthorne studies <clears throat> now El uh, George Elton Mayo was in charge of for want of a better word certain experiments on human behavior uh, that sounds very ominous and very uh, it doesn't sound polite and nice to to experiment on human behavior but uh, this was early days of industrialization and early days of trying to come to terms with what was the ideal working platform for for employees what, what is it that would engage employees and enable them to have a good working experience and uh, give them some sort of psychological payback, psychological uh, benefit from engaging in in work. So it's not experiments in any sinister way, it was making observations and trying to work out from the observations what would improve efficiency and what would also improve the working lives of the employees. Now these were these observations, or for want of a better word, I just call it experiments, um, these were carried out at the Hawthorne Works of the uh, Western Electric Company in Chicago between 1924 and 1927. So these are quite well established studies and forms the, the basis for much subsequent work in management theory and in particular in relationship to motivation. His research findings have contributed to organizational development in terms of human relations and motivation theory. So what Mayo found is very important and it's very important that students of organizations and of organization structures and and of motivation and looking at human relationships within the, the workplace students of these activities should be aware of Mayo's work because this is extremely important it was groundbreaking work at the time uh, it was new the methodology was new the the findings were surprising and it led to a much greater debate about how to effectively use people within working situations so that the the people who were employed would get a, a better psychological uh, treatment if you like or a better psychological uh, sense, sense of engagement and usefulness and worth from the activity but as a consequence of that would put back more effort more productivity and would try harder to empathize with the objectives of the organization which would lead to all sorts of economies for example uh, less interventionist management and uh, greater initiative on the part of the employees so this work is extremely important in the context of management theory, motivation theory, human relations organizational theory itself. 
Now the following findings of these investigations, the, the Mayo investigations, uh, from that he, he came to the following conclusions. Now this is what I'm going to talk about in this session. Just list out the conclusions and have a few words about them and that's all we intend to do in this video. It's a very short video just meant to to look over the findings of the um, Hawthorne experiments or the, the Hawthorne study. Well the first one is work is a group activity. By and large people like to work in groups. They like human contact. They like to see others. They like to have some sort of contact with others. They don't want to be isolated working in solitary conditions. They want to have uh, human contact. They want to be able to to speak to others. They want to see others how they're working and and lighten the day in a sense through human contact. And in doing this they will become more productive. The social world of the adult is primarily influenced by work activity. And if you think about uh, the way we live our lives. We we have a social life, we have a family life, we have a work life. And in a sense that's the way our lives are broken up, probably into three main areas. And the work life could be eight hours a day, with travelling maybe ten hours a day. Sometimes employers want us to work longer maybe 11 hours a day. Now that is really a large part of our waking day because we have to sleep for seven or eight hours a night or whatever it is. So a big proportion of our life is spent at work. And that means that our social world and our work world tend to interact. So we have friends from work, we have contacts from work, we associate with people at work. So work is an important part of our social uh, life. The need for recreation, uh, sorry, recognition, uh, security and sense of belonging is more important in determining workers' morale and productivity than the physical conditions under which he or she works. So the need for recognition, security and sense of belonging is very important. We, we want to be a part of the organisation but we want the organisation to recognise us and recognise us as important, as individuals and as individuals who are trying to uh, perhaps advance the aims of the or organisation. But we also want security, security of employment and indeed security in terms of physical security whilst at work. We want to work in safe conditions. We want health and safety to be put in place and we want the management to show that they care about our safety and about our security. And we also want to feel that the working environment is, is a part of our, uh, our setting are setting in life. One setting could be the home because that's where we go. The other setting could be work because that's where we go as well. And we become familiar with the environment, we become familiar with the people, with the processes. Um, we have social interaction and awareness of the, the physical environment within which work takes place. And we want that sense of belonging. We want, we want the management to recognise that we belong there. That that's where we go to, to earn a living. Um, a complaint is not necessarily uh, an objective recital of facts. It's commonly a symptom manifesting disturbance of an individual's status position. So sometimes when people are disgruntled at work uh, it's not necessarily 
the the issue that causes the the problem it could be a wider issue a wider issue that the person's status is being challenged or the person's status is uh, not being recognized that the person feels that he or she is just a part of the machinery a part of the the technology of the business they are not being treated as humans so sometimes when issues arise uh, the issues are just what is what is discussed the real issue is underlying this the real issue is that the the people are not they, they feel that they're not being uh, rewarded recognized and treated in a manner which is in a sense consistent with their status as as humans they don't want to be a part of the the technology of the business they don't want to be treated like the machinery they don't want to be uh, inserted into a production process and they feel that they are no more important perhaps than the machine that's feeding components to them these are humans and they want to be treated as such so when issues arise a complaint or an issue arises they want perhaps the deeper explanation to be treated and the deeper the deeper explanation of what's happened is that they feel alienated within the workplace the worker is a person whose attitudes and effectiveness are conditioned by social demands from both inside and outside of the the work plant so the workers attitudes and effectiveness within the workplace are clearly influenced by training programs offered by the HR section of the business and uh, influenced by what the management have said and what the line manager requires and uh, what the other colleagues at work are doing and thinking and saying and, and when they interact with them over break times what what information is being passed around and so clearly their attitudes and effectiveness are based on this but they're also based on what's happening outside and there are big movements within society in general uh, these could be political movements or social movements or indeed just almost fashion movements but there are issues that influence people that operate globally there are ones that operate nationally there's ones that operate regionally or within the local area and people take on board these attitudes so they're influenced by what uh, perhaps people in the media are saying and their attitudes towards work and their effectiveness at work which is related to their attitude of course this will be conditioned upon how the message from outside supports or contradicts the message inside the work what is it that the management is saying inside on a day-to-day -day basis what's the policy of the management and contrast that with perhaps messages from the outside what perhaps some great thinkers are saying or what has been published in the in the newspapers or what's what's in the news or uh, what what is considered to be good practice because information about good practice spreads enlightened management and the desire to have enlightened management that spreads and the workers within an organization will contrast what is deemed to be good practice which is disseminated say outside of the organizations what people people talk about and uh, what are the issues associated with the economy and uh, innovation and change and products and uh, consumerism and so on issues associated with those these will be contrasted with the attitudes and opinions of management locally within the business and this can influence the degree to which employees are engaged with the business or 
they want to leave the business, they're disaffected with the, the way management's behaving or, or thinking or to see it as old fashioned or uh, out of step with the rest of the movements within the society. So workers' attitudes and effectiveness are conditioned by inside the organization, issues inside the organization and issues outside of the organization. Informal groups within uh, the work plant exercise strong social controls over the work habits and attitudes of individual workers. So there are informal groups within workplaces. Uh, it could be organized labor, it could be a trade union, or it could be uh, simply a group of workers who have a long experience of working for the particular company perhaps but who have got very strong personalities and have very strong influences on others so that when the, the workers have a chance to mix perhaps at a, a, having a break or a lunch time or, or whatever these more dominant individuals can assert what they believe to be required within the workplace and this could show, sow the seeds of discontent or it could be that they support the management more than likely not though but they could support the management and it could lead to, to greater harmony but there are individuals within workplaces uh, humans are not all the same some are very very strong willed some are very assertive some are more passive and um, so it's always the case that we'll have uh, informal groups, not organised, just people uh, asserting their opinions, but asserting their opinions in a very forceful manner and that will influence others and it will influence the attitude of other workers. The change from an established society in the home to an adaptive society uh, in the work plant resulting from the use of new techniques tends continually to disrupt social organization of a work plant and industry generally. So the change from an established society in the home to an adaptive society in the work plant resulting from the, uh, the use of new techniques now this tends to be disruptive of social organization of work. Um, we start by by looking in this case at uh, the ways in which we live. We we lived originally. Uh, well, let's not go back too far. But let's say originally we lived on land, and and our our whole essence was built around the seasons and the the requirements of land, and we we worked on farms or whatever. And when industrialization came along, we had to adapt to the requirements of the machines and of the technology within the, the factories. With At the start of the Industrial Revolution, all new skills had to be learned by, by workers who were adapting from an agrarian setting to an industrial setting. Now, the changes in technology has never really eased up. There are periods of time when they seem to be going slower and then there are periods of time when they seem to be going very rapidly. But as these uh, changes come about and are adopted by industry, and they're adopted by industry because generally speaking they're more reliable, better quality output, they're cheaper in the long run and more productive and so on. But as they're adopted they, there is disruption within the workplace. The, the social organization of work is broken down and there is less communications between the workers because uh, there is almost no point in the communications about work because the technology is leading and the technology is ever-changing and becoming more pervasive. There's almost a sense of hopelessness amongst the, the workers that there's nothing they can do except go along with what is happening. So 
we moved from the established society, whatever the established society is, uh, in the 21st century the established society is the way sociologists and, and thinkers about society explain to us. But the established society within work is in a state of flux because of the constant introduction of new technology, new ways of working, um, new channels of communications, uh, more information available to customers and suppliers and uh, different ways in which the organization is structured. Plus, of course, wider cultural issues because of globalization and so on. So this tends to continually disrupt the social organization of a work plant and of the, the industry generally. Now these are just some uh, ideas associated with Mayo's uh, study. Um, when we deal with the Mayo study in other videos you'll see that these are reworked and there are different ways of explaining the outcomes and in fact if you consider the, the work on Mayo's uh, study itself and how the study was set up and uh, the outcomes associated with reconfiguring work and uh, and and so on, changing tea breaks and increasing the tea breaks and so on and, and what happens to productivity. These were uh, the early findings associated with Mayo's work and this was a revelation to to thinkers uh, who were working on the design of, of work patterns and uh, who were thinking about productivity and efficiency and so on. It seemed to be counterproductive, uh, counterintuitive, I should say. Sorry, counterintuitive, that people be given longer time to to have a break could be more efficient. And so it, there was a lot of findings associated with Mayo's original work that became very important for thinkers in management science. And the way this particular video is, is structured is these are sort of more generalized but more follow-up ideas associated with the outcomes from the uh, Hawthorne study. But that's all I'm going to deal with here so it's uh, just a, a different perspective, slightly different perspective but again following on from what happened with the, the Hawthorne study. That's all I'm going to do deal with in this one so I'm going to leave it at that and say uh, thank you for watching.